Welcome, everyone, to the On Poly Podcast. I'm Steve Pakin. And I'm John Michael McGrath. Today on the pod, the legislature is back, and the big issue again is bike lanes. The PC government surprises many by hiring the former federal liberal health minister. The leader of the NDP will visit us here on set to share her views on how she'd do things differently if she were in charge. And in your column, my column, I'll look at a liberal private member bill that could have made it easier to refit offices into homes if the government hadn't voted against it. Hmm. And I'm focused on a former Ontario cabinet minister who has forgotten more about provincial politics than JMM and I will ever know. It's Friday, October 25th, 2024. So let's get to it. JMM, good to see you again, Hello, panel. Sir. There we go. Get around the mics there. Yeah, yeah, a little <laughs> tricky, a little tricky. I guess uh, a little program note off the top here. We have been having more guests in our little set here uh, over the last few weeks. We had Bonnie Crombie in, the Liberal leader, a while ago. We had Mike Schreiner, the Green leader, last week. Uh, we got Marit Stiles, the NDP leader, official opposition leader today. Next week, because it's the fall economic statement, yeah. the Minister of Finance, Peter Bethlen Falvey, will be here on set with us. So, um, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, nice we to have some folks in. We didn't have a lot of guests in uh, in their previous season here, and uh, so if, if our viewers and listeners uh, want to let us know about whether they like having the guests or whether <laughs> they prefer just to have the two of us gabbing, uh, you know, we, we will give you the uh, uh, email address uh, at the bottom of the episode, as we always do. Uh, let us know uh, how you feel about it. Yeah, this is a democracy. We we like people to vote and tell us what they think. Yeah, we like audience participation. There we go. <laughs> and with that, let's get out to issue one. After five months of not sitting, the Ontario legislature was back in business this week, as MPPs gathered at Queen's Park to once again do the public's business. And as often is the case with this government, municipal rather than provincial issues dominated the headlines. Okay, JMM, once again, we are talking about cyclists versus motorists because the government has now unveiled its so-called anti-bike lane legislation. I don't know what else you want to call it. I guess it's got an official name. It does. It does. The Reducing Gridlock Saving You Time Act oh, there we go. is the name of the new bill that will require municipalities to seek the approval of the Minister of Transportation uh, for any new bike lanes they install. Uh, the minister has also announced that the province is going to uh, pay the cost for removing uh, existing bike lanes that fail to meet uh, the new requirements that the government is imposing. Can I make a churlish little point? This Because I know we're going to talk about this and I... Yes. And I I know where you're coming from on this. When provinces tell municipalities what they have to do, but they're prepared to pay for those, I like that. Yes. When provinces mandate municipalities to do things and then say, now you find the money in your own budgets to do these things we want you to do, yes. I think that's more intolerable. So shall we start by giving them credit for saying, we want you to do this and we'll pay for it? Yes, I think that is preferable you'll, you'll to the alternative. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know... Uh, municipalities having no constitutional status, there is no requirement for the uh, Ford government to uh, e even put money on the table. Yeah. Uh, whether that is money well spent is another <laughs> issue. <laughs> okay, so the uh, taking out the bike lanes and the province being prepared to pay for them is part of the bill. Yes. What else is in the bill? Uh, most of the bill is actually dedicated to uh, making it easier for uh, things like the proposed Highway 413 and other uh, provincial priority highways to uh, sail through various uh, provincial approval processes, including environmental assessments. Um, an interesting little uh, potential wrench in the gears here is that um, the Professional Engineers Government of Ontario Union uh, is proposing to have kind of a labor action where they would have their members basically stop participating in any of the planning and, and engineering work that needs to go into uh, these highways. Uh, obviously, this is a government, I mean, the government has made no secret that these are uh, among its top priorities uh, going forward. And uh, if the engineers start withdrawing their services, I mean, if I withdraw my services from TVO, like you can find another podcaster, uh, engineers are a legally protected profession. I will never find anybody. Else. It's impossible. <laughs> That's very please, sweet of you. Please do not work to rule. Uh, and and uh, but but you know you cannot just find other engineers uh, th like that. That is a protected mm -hmm. profession. So this potentially has some very serious consequences for the government. Um, there are other measures in the bill. Uh, it, they are creating a fund for smaller municipalities to uh, get uh, money for uh, pothole prevention and repair. Um, 
uh, the city of Toronto, I imagine, will not qualify for this uh, fund, but uh, on my bike rides, we sure could use some pothole attention. <laughs> um, they are also pr proposing to uh, raise the speed limit to uh, 110 kilometers an hour on 400 series highways where it is safe to do so. They've done a lot of that already. They have, yeah. and uh, they are also proposing to update the design standards for future highways to um, make... Uh, even higher speed limits uh, possible. Uh, if, if this isn't obvious to people, but the uh, there there is a certain amount that you can raise the speed limit on, like a 400 series highway. But uh, beyond a certain point, you go you have cars going faster than is safe for like the the turns in the road and mm -hmm. the, the width of the lanes. And so you need to start thinking about how you build the highway differently if you want to get up to 120, 130 kilometers an hour safely. 130? Uh, can you do 130 safely? Like 120? Okay, 130. Uh, That's pushing it, man. Yes, well, and this is why the government is proposing to look at design standards. I mean, there are, uh, you know, highways in the world where uh, there are design speeds that high, I believe. But hmm. whether we could do that in Ontario and whether you could have somebody go safely from a, let's say, 110 kilometer an hour hi highway to a 130 is, is a very different you question. You know what? The way people drive here, I wouldn't want to see anybody doing 130 on the highways uh, here. Yeah, the... the uh, well, I'm, I'm going to avoid the unkind comment about the median Ontarian motorist. <laughs> um, finally, there is also a little bit of uh, work. Uh, you know, uh, one of the other uh, priorities for this government, rural broadband, something they are very big on. Um, and th there is a, a measure in this law to expedite uh, land uh, expropriations to make it easier to uh, install uh, rural broadband projects. So big bill does a lot of things. Let me circle back to the 413 because this government has been relentless in saying that it wants to get shovels in the ground and get the 413 highway going. That's the new east-west highway that would be north of the 407. Uh, this potential job action by the engineers, uh, what did you call it, a, a wrench in the gears? That's yes. Pretty, yes. <laughs> that's pretty, pretty good cyclist metaphor there. Uh, th this government's done everything it can to try to get irritants for this project that they want desperately out of the way, right? They made a deal with the feds for the feds not to have an environmental assessment, which yep. was their legal authority to do so, and they are not doing that. Um, we know all the opposition parties at Queen's Park say if they win the next election, they're going to come in and cancel the 413. That's what they say. So clearly this government wants to get going fast on this thing so that we're past the point of no return and you can't cancel it. Right. And I, I mean, if they want a spring election, I'm not sure it's just going to be physically possible to do enough work that you couldn't plausibly cancel the project. Um, but I, I think this is partly about signaling by uh, Doug Ford and the PC party, uh, in short, which side they are on, right? Um, I don't think everybody who drives a car necessarily like self-identifies as like a capital M motorist, but there are people who do. And Doug Ford is telling them in you know big, bold, flashing letters, I am on your side, not the side of the cyclists, right? Um, and I think the 413 is part of that. This move against bike lanes is part of that. Um, it's not terribly good congestion policy. <laughs> and I just, <laughs> I, I, I can't drop this topic without just, I'm going to give you some numbers here. There are over a thousand kilometers of arterial roads in the city of Toronto. There are another 700 kilometers of collector roads. The premier is talking about uh, reversing a, a few dozen kilometers of bike lanes at the most. Even if you grant the argument that bike lanes reduce traffic throughput, which I don't, but I'm going to set that aside, <laughs> this is not a serious congestion policy. Mm. This is like homeopathy for street design. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, let me do two follow-ups on that. Number one, history tells us you can always cancel a highway. And I remember a little over 50 years ago, Bill Davis canceled the Allen Expressway in the northwest part of Toronto, which shocked everybody. Yeah. But he did it. And he actually burnished his credentials as a green Tory when he did do that. So even when they start building a highway and you think it's inevitable, it isn't necessarily inevitable. So we should keep that in mind. Number two, an innocent little question here for you. If you wanted to improve traffic flow, as opposed to taking out bike lanes, could you just remove on-street parking, make people park on the side streets, for example, and create another lane of traffic on the major thoroughfares by saying you can't park on University Avenue anymore, you can't park on Bloor Street anymore. Uh, you could do that. Uh, the city of Toronto, when it created the uh, Bloor-Danforth bike lane uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, at least in my neck of the woods along uh, Danforth, uh, they chose not to do that. And this is where we get into like, you know, this is all political, right? There was a, a, a functionally a bargain made with local businesses that instead of 
taking the street side parking out and making that the space for bike lanes, uh, they would take out more space so that you could have both the street side um, uh, most of the street side par parking got retained mm -hmm. and we also got bike lanes yeah. and the geometry of this is very weird if you ever bike along the, the that stretch of Danforth uh, you, you end up doing a lot of weird turns and stuff but my, my point is just that like this was a, a a political decision and not one that was made purely about uh, traffic engineering yeah I was in an Uber last night and the, and the Uber driver said it is really not good it is really dangerous to have bike lanes parking lanes traffic flow through lanes and pedestrians who are presumably trying to figure out their way through all of this as well is kind of too, in their view, in his view, too much going on there to be safe. Yeah. I, I, I mean, we can get into issues of, of, you know, proper street design at another time, but I, you know, I, I do think that um, it's just important for the, the audience to remember that like, you know, there, there are ways that you can make these decisions that are like have technical merit or planning expertise. And then all the time, every single time, and it's relevant to this discussion about bike lanes with the premier. Mm -hmm. uh, there is the politics of who gets access to public space, and and in what way do they get access? Uh, I know that um, uh, David Lepofsky, who we've referred to on this show before, uh, has said that if the province is talking about uh, bike lanes, well, uh, people with disability have an interest in the the precise nature of like, are, do bike lanes put uh, cyclists in, in conflict with uh, pedestrians or and potentially people who have disabilities on sidewalks. That's a, absolutely a valid question of, of public policy. And again, who has access to public space on what terms? Right on. And with that, we're off to issue two. The province has announced that former federal health minister, Dr. Jane Philpott, now the head of Queen's University's medical school, will chair the new primary care action team. The team's mission is to figure out how to solve the family doc crisis in this province, which currently has two and a half million Ontarians without a GP. Okay, let's split this up as we discuss this here. Uh, there's a, a mission statement, and then there is the politics of this. Yes. So we'll do the mission statement first. What's Dr. Philpott supposed to do here? Uh, the goal is to connect every person in Ontario who does not currently have a primary uh, care physician uh, with a uh, primary care, either a physician or a team, within the next five years. Uh, they are... Uh, planning to implement a, a team-based approach to uh, uh, primary care using uh, publicly funded uh, doctors, nurses, and specialists to uh, alleviate the administrative burden uh, on healthcare workers, right? Lots of people have uh, family doctors. That might be the, the go-to image they think of as primary care, but a lot of family doctors these days saying they simply cannot afford to continue their practices in the way they have been, in part because of that administrative burden of being uh, a, a sole practitioner uh, in Ontario. Right. I remember uh, actually sitting on the set right over there talking to Dr. Philpott several months ago. Uh, she had just written a book as she came in for an interview, and at that time she said, I am prepared to work with anybody if it means trying to make some progress uh, on the family doc healthcare crisis in this province, and so she is obviously taking her own advice. I'm not sure anybody saw this appointment coming, though. Um, this is really different. Uh, <laughs> having said that, as impressed as the leader of the Ontario Liberal Party, Bonnie Crombie, is with Dr. Jane Philpott's talents, she has said publicly she's not completely sold on this arrangement. How come? The overarching concern here is that the Ford government will uh, give Philpott uh, the assignment, uh, will uh, wait for her to produce a report of recommendations. Um, you can imagine the timeline here would be that uh, any, uh, any, any substantive report would come after the next election, so that this is in part uh, uh, a, a, an effort to defuse any accusations that the government is going to face about health care policy. Oh, well, you know, I know things are tough, but we're going to wait for Philpott to, to make her report back to us. And then once the report is eventually returned to the government, they will not act on the recommendations. And that's the fear. That's the fear. And, uh, you know, we can go through a few examples where this has happened in the past, right? Um, the, uh, one uh, close to my heart, uh, the Housing Affordability Task Force it issued a very substantive report about uh, ways that the government could get uh, more privately built uh, housing uh, made in Ontario. Uh, the government did act on some of the recommendations, but the biggest and most effective ones were also the most contentious ones. They have largely been ignored. Uh, the uh, government's uh, a blue ribbon panel on uh, post-secondary education uh, largely ignored. That report uh, said that the uh, sector needed, I forget what the number was, the billion dollar uh, bailout. Absolutely. Uh, uh, the, the government did not come to the table with that much money. Um, 
we can go back to COVID, where the uh, uh, government had a, a very contentious uh, relationship with uh, scientific advisors and eventually uh, disbanded the uh, scientific advisory panel. Um, and even more recently, you know, uh, I, I think of um, the chief medical officer of health, uh, Dr. Kieran Moore, uh, has made recommendations like um, uh, raising the drinking age to 21. Uh, obviously, uh, this government is uh, choosing to go a different direction on the availability of alcohol in public. A, a, a non-starter for anybody between the ages of 19 and 21. I uh, yes, sure indeed. That too. Uh, okay, so that's the mission statement and the initial reaction to it. Let's look at the politics of this move. And the reality is, Dr. Philpott uh, could have been a huge star candidate for Bonnie Crombie and the Liberals in the next provincial election. And, and when we spoke to Bonnie Crombie on this podcast, she at least seemed alive to that possibility. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, unless this agreement between Dr. Philpott and the provincial government completely falls apart, she has said, this takes me out of the election cycle for the next five years. Uh, this would take precedence, this work that she is doing for the, uh, for the government of Ontario. So... Premier Ford has very cleverly put somebody in charge of the family doc crisis whose credentials are beyond reproach. This is also a conservative premier appointing a high-profile liberal to an important job, and he has also taken a significant, a potentially significant player for his chief opponent off the playing field in time for the next election. That's... That's pretty good politics, you got to admit. It, it's a very smart move. I don't think you can understate the significance uh, here of, uh, you know, even losing just the, the, the possibility of somebody like Phil Pott. Um, having somebody of her stature, um, I mean, it would have been good for the Liberal Party on its own terms, could have also encouraged other uh, people who, uh, to be blunt, uh, maybe are uncertain about whether the Liberal Party is, is really in a winning position right now. Um, it might have encouraged them to, to come forward as well. I mean, every opposition party struggles with candidate recruitment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the Phil Potts spoke at the Liberal uh, AGM uh, earlier this fall in London, uh, gave some interviews where she suggested she was not done with elected politics, uh, which is why we raised the question when we spoke with uh, mm -hmm. Crombie on this podcast. Um, so, you, you know, you, you've, I think, correctly split this between the, the, the health care policy and the, the, the politics side of it. And the, the other weird thing here, and it's, it's an angle I think we can talk about just a little bit, is that there's also, um, for people who are um, soured on the current prime minister, uh, polls tell us there are many of them, mm -hmm. uh, it's also worth remembering that Phil Putt was ejected from the federal liberal caucus over the SNC-Lavalin affair and, uh, or during that uh, uh, scandal. And uh, there was no question of uh, whether her uh, conduct was uh, unethical. It was whether she was getting along with within the caucus and with the party leader. Um, I think with the distance of time, there are people who think that that was a poor decision on Mr. Trudeau's part. And so Doug Ford inviting her back into public life in this way, um, it, it, on top of everything else, it, it does have this uh, effect of both reminding people of something that they probably don't love to th think about the, the current prime minister. We know that, or at least we suspect that the, the election is being uh, timed for how it is because Doug Ford would, would like to have Justin Trudeau still there and still have people thinking about mm -hmm. the, the current uh, liberal leader um, while he's running as a conservative. Um, yeah, th th it takes a bunch of boxes here. And I, I don't know uh, which of Ford's advisors uh, recommended that uh, she be hired for this position. Uh, but uh, yeah, that person has earned a raise. I mean, again, this, just, this, this ticks a lot of boxes, both politically and policy-wise. It is very, very clever politics. We got to give them that. It's and with that, we're off to our interview with the leader of the official opposition. The NDP, of course, has formed government only once in Ontario history, in 1990 under Premier Bob Ray. But New Democrats feel they've got some wind in their sails these days. They have formed the official opposition in the last two consecutive elections, and that's never happened before in the party's history. They're also setting fundraising records. So we thought we'd get the party's leader, Marit Stiles, in here to hear more about her plans for her party and the province. Good to have you back here. It's great to be here. Pleasure to see you. JMM, fire away. Uh, let's start with uh, something from the current uh, events. Uh, should Queen's Park be telling municipalities uh, where and uh, if they can put bike lanes in their streets? Ooh. <laughs> what was the what was the what was the premier's line on this this yesterday? Nasty bike lanes. Nasty bike yeah, lanes. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to go. By the way, in Halloween, that's definitely going to be my costume. <laughs> no question. Um, <clears throat> you know, I um, 
I don't think that it is the province's role to be, I would say, like meddling in these issues in that way. I think the province has some pretty big uh, issues that we should be addressing as a province that we're not. And so, uh, you know, I understand. Look, uh, Doug Ford, he lost this battle at city council. He wants to fight it out here again. Um, and, uh, and I know that there are also challenges, right? Congestion, gridlock challenges. But what I would like to see the provincial government doing is delivering on some of the, like, for example, transit uh, that they're supposed to be building. So, you know, when the premier went after this bike lanes issue uh, in the legislature this week, it was in response to one of my questions about when we're going to see the Eglinton LRT open. What's the date? Uh, Let's go. Um, Instead of answering that question, he talks about bike lanes. So I think it's a bit of a distraction, clearly. Um, And the unfortunate part, I think, is that If we see a big move of cyclists, many people are cycling these days in the GTA. Many people are doing it because it's more affordable for them as well. And I'm very concerned about, you know, what it's going to mean once we have all of those road users back in the same lane again. So I, I'm, I'm concerned. I don't think it uh, it's helpful. Um, and I'm hoping that, uh, well, and, and, and honestly, we haven't actually seen what his plan is for this. Well, if you think about the political calculation behind this, though, he's presumably prepared to give up the, the cycling vote, quote unquote, <laughs> of people who live you know, closer to downtowns, and he'll take the inner suburbs, he'll take the 905, he'll Mm -hmm. take the exurbs, and that's what he needs to win. So if you look at the political calculation here, is it not bad on his part? Well, you know what, I mean, and, and, and I actually happen to believe that Really, that shouldn't be the only consideration. (laughs) Call me crazy. I think we should be making decisions based on evidence. Uh, Policy should be based on evidence and um, certainly empathy. And I'm concerned that this is the game that he continues to play. Um, You know, I, I think that he's refusing to actually address the issues that Ontarians are are actually really concerned about. So yes, this is certainly on some people's minds without question. But I think there are other bigger issues that are really people are really struggling with. Well, one of them's health care. And you brought that up this past 100%. week. So let's let's start with yeah. that. He's hired Jane Philpott, the former liberal federal right. health minister, to come up with a five year plan basically mm-hmm. to get everybody a family doc. Your view on that appointment? Well, as I said, I have a lot of respect uh, for Dr. Philpott. I met with her recently, um, actually just earlier this year at Queen's University, and uh, I wanted to talk to her about you know her book that she put out and mm. some of her thoughts about how we address the uh, family doctor shortage in Ontario. Uh, I think she has some good ideas. I'm concerned, I will say, that this is a government that has so far not tended to listen to experts even their own experts. Uh, So I I hope it works. I hope she does offer something because look, at the end of the day, um, we have to start solving these problems. Ontarians, two and a half million Ontarians without a family doctor right now. That number is gonna almost double in the next couple of years. It is a crisis already. It was a crisis 10 years ago, uh, but now, I mean, we are really uh, in a deep crisis, and so I am hopeful that she can help us figure a way out of this. But I have to say, I, I don't, you know, the government has had, this government has had almost seven years now to address this issue, and they have failed. Things have continued to get worse, so I don't have a lot of confidence in the in the government to make anything positive happen here. Do you think it is uh, harmful to you or to the, the Liberals, given that you fish in the same waters for a lot of voters uh, for the government to take a, a potential star uh, liberal candidate off the board with an appointment like this? Well, look, I, I I don't know what the liberals were conversations they were happening, having with Dr. Phil, but I've heard some rumors too. Uh, I, I I don't know if she has, I, I can't speak for Dr. Phil Pot, if she had any kind of political ambition in that regard. I mean, she's obviously run before and been elected and had that, that and office. And was open to running again. She and, was and open was about saying that. she was open to running again. Um, I think that um, what I do know about her is that she does want to make a difference. And so however she makes that difference, you know, some people it's running and it's being elected and it's the role that we're playing. And, and others, it's you know, maybe a little more behind the scenes, working on the policy at the civil service level and moving that forward. And I, I think she's shown that she has um, a real commitment to this. So I, I will, you know, won't hear me say a bad word about her at all. I, I give her, I, I wish her all the best. I am very skeptical about what this government's actual interest is in solving this problem. I, I am one of those people who really, I have to say, I, I look at the, the opportunities they've had 
to address this and to address other issues in our healthcare system, like the hallway healthcare crisis. Um, and I wonder if they really have want to fix it at all, or if their whole plan has been to sort of allow it, allow it to crumble and replace it with private clinics and privatization. And I, I suspect that is definitely part of the plan. So we'll see if they manage to solve this problem. It is without a question, I will say, one of the number one issues that people talk to me about when I'm traveling around the province of Ontario in every community, the fact that they, people can't find a family physician. I mean, do you worry at all that it's window dressing uh, for, you, you talked about the, the, the privatization. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you, you have a, a very critical view of the, the health care policy this government has implemented. Do you, do you worry that this appointment will be a way for uh, Doug Ford or, or uh, others in his government to say, like, whoa, whoa, don't be yeah. so alarmist. Look, we've got Jane Philpott here. How bad could we be? <laughs> it's possible. You know, I was raising, I, I think that is part of their thinking, possibly. But um, look, I, I, I've always said, too, you know, if we can actually get things moving in a positive direction, great. If she can be part of that solution, fantastic. Um, I've asked the minister, uh, well, and the premier all week uh, in the legislature this week, questions about uh, the hallway healthcare crisis, the lack of doctors, the, uh, as you know, there's a crisis right now in supplies for people in home care. It's really awful. And, uh, and they, they, they actually just stood up and said, you know, things are really better than they've ever been before. That's, that literally is what the, the premier said to me. And I just shook my head. How can anybody in that government actually argue that things are better today than they were? And, and, I, and I will say, in healthcare, the crisis was real six years ago, too. He was elected to fix the hallway healthcare crisis. We remember that. And now it's about, it's about twice as bad as it was. So we, uh, we have not seen solutions either from the liberal, uh, previous liberal government or this current conservative government. Uh, switching track slightly, uh, three of the current uh, New Democrat MPPs yeah. in the legislature are opting not to run again. Some are moving to uh, federal politics. They're uh, all moving to federal sorry, politics. Sorry, they're all moving yeah. to federal yeah. politics. Trying to. Yes, trying uh, to. <laughs> yes, That's right. yeah. seeking nominations. <laughs> um, how pissed are you at them? <laughs> no, you know, I, I'm really not. Honestly, I'm not. Uh, look, I first of all, you know, I, I was thinking about this uh, issue recently because you know, for me, when I think about why I ran you know, to be an MPP, you know, you got to and people ask me this all the time, like if, you know, they're thinking about running. I say, you know, you've got to find that passion, that thing you actually want to change. Uh, because this is some tough times when you're elected. And so you, you better know what you're in it for. And I think that if uh, my colleagues, you know, see an issue that they want to, something they really want to move and change at the federal level, all power to them. You know, I really do. And I think that's very common, right, for a lot of us to spend some time at the provincial level and then think, you know what, I'd like to see what if I can make this kind of change at the federal level. And I think it's great. Um, they've been excellent MPPs, all three of them, fantastic representatives. These are all ridings that we have uh, held in a very strong way um, and have history in. And I am hearing about candidates uh, that are interested in running in each of them. And I feel very confident that we'll be able to continue to uh, represent those communities at the provincial level as well. I'm so proud of you. You actually cussed in that question. Well, I wasn't you know, sure you were going to do it. We'll I'm, see if I'm, I get bleeped or not. Yeah, no, I'm kind of <laughs> proud of you. Okay, the setup for my next question is politics and life are not fair. Here we go. <laughs> NDP governments out west seem to get elected, uh, NDP uh, options, seem to get elected as government on semi-regular basis. Mm -hmm. They've got a decent reputation for balancing budgets and spending yes. within their means. The NDP, for whatever reason, for good or ill, does not have that reputation in Ontario. And as we said at the beginning, has only won once in the last 157 years. How important is fiscal prudence to you on your list of priorities? Mm -hmm. I think it's actually, for me, it is a, it's a fiscal prudence, fiscal responsibility okay. is something I take very seriously. I think that um, I see the role that I have now as the leader of the opposition and as an MPP as an enormous privilege. And in government, uh, I believe that it is, you know, we are spending the people's money. You know, we are making decisions that will have enormous impact on on, on the people of Ontario and future generations. And I take all of that responsibility very seriously. Um, and I think when you look at, and I do, I look to um, NDP governments uh, in other jurisdictions, particularly in the West, and how fiscally prudent, as you said, 
they have been. I mean, Tommy Douglas was a fantastic example of this. Uh, and so that is kind of where my politics, I think personally, are, are rooted. Um, and, I, and I have to say, um, yeah, I don't think our reputation is a fair one <laughs> by any means. I mean, I look at the way that this government is spending money and frankly wasting the taxpayers' dollars it, it's extraordinary to me that they think that they can, frankly, you know, spend their way out of things, and, and they're doing it in such an ineffective way. They're throwing money at schemes, and which end up being scandals, instead of actually investing in smart ways that are going to directly um, affect people's lives and make life better for people. And you know, I, I'll say some one other thing, which is, um, when I first came to this province from Newfoundland um, in the '90s. This was the economic powerhouse of Canada. It is no longer. Uh, you and I have talked about this, Steve. It's a, it's a have, we are a have-not province. The Premier of BC recently, unfortunately, reminded me of this. <laughs> you know, and I, it was uh, sobering. Uh, it's, it, it, this is not the Ontario that, um, that I moved to, and I think it is, means that we are having a very difficult time competing uh, with other provinces and other jurisdictions. And so in terms of the future of this province and what we can offer future generations, um, I think we have to address uh, the fact that we are not building the province that people want to come to. And that means we have to take seriously also the social infrastructure of this province. Uh, you've talked about expenditures and, and building. Uh, so uh, the government has uh, really uh, made building Ontario part of uh, its mantra going into a uh, prospective uh, election in the next year. Um, let's talk about some of those projects and I'll get your take on them. Um, would you, uh, if it is underway, uh, would you uh, complete or continue uh, Highway 413? Well, I mean, if they get it started, which I'm very skeptical about, I, I look, I, it is interesting to me that this is a government that will, you know, can, can, can pull, I don't, remove all kinds of regulations and just, you know, go that extra mile to do things like this but can't build housing. You know, I, I think if it's up to me, whether that starts or not, I do not understand why this government hasn't moved on some obvious immediate solutions to congestion and gridlock. Um, we have raised on numerous occasions and put it to the floor in the house in a motion um, that the government should move freight trucks over to the 407, uh, make it free. My goodness, use the wildly underutilized 407 and hugely expensive 407 uh, to remove some of the congestion on the 401. So I don't understand their obsession with the 413, to be honest. I think there are better, more immediate solutions. I also would rather see them focus on some of the bigger transit projects that I think would move more people more effectively. Um, and, but I guess we'll see how far down the road, <laughs> literally, they've gotten with this project by the time uh, we replace them as government. Well, that's the question. Oh, 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 very confident. <laughs> by the time we replace them as government. Okay. <laughs> at, at that raises a bunch more questions. For example, they want to move the Science Center to the waterfront. If right. that Science Center is already in the process oh. of being built by the time you take over but isn't completed, do you complete it or do you shut it down and go back to Don Mills? I mean, it's such a nightmare, right? Because, like I was just saying, the legislature, you know— the Science Center, just earlier this year when I was at the Science Center, it was bustling with school field trips. It was, there were, you know, all kinds of science experiments happening and wonderful projects and exhibits. It was very well utilized. And then, and then what did the government do? They just shut it down and now they're moving, you know, into these like pop-ups basically in... Uh, um, the Sherway in, Gardens in, in the or Sherway, something. Like, yeah. And, you know, this is... This is an outrageous, uh, I think, deceit as well, that they, they didn't tell the people of Ontario what they were really going to do here and when they were going to do it. But if it's half built, are you really not going to finish it? I mean, I think you don't you know, have to look at what the alternatives are for that space because, look, they bulldozed the whole of Ontario place now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, it's dreadful what's happening. Um, but I do think that what we have at, at the Science Centre is a building that is a really important structure it's in a really important place for a lot of underserved communities with, uh, frankly, a lot of children as well. And, uh, and so I would want to see it reopen at that location. Absolutely. Uh, what they do uh, down at Therma is a whole other story. I mean, because to me, this whole science, moving the Science Centre was clearly uh, just the Premier's way of padding 
the Therma project. And, and so, you know, that is not good planning. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not fair to the people of Ontario. Um, but this is what we see again and again with this government. You've anticipated what's next on our uh, Yeah, list. exactly. Uh, she's not reading the script right no, now. No, no, I can't see it. <laughs> um, no, uh, but you mentioned the spa. Uh, we've talked yeah. on the podcast before about uh, the, the lease seems to be structured to make it very difficult to, to break the That's lease right. to get out of uh, this potential uh, spa deal. Uh, but, uh, you know, would you look at uh, either breaking the lease or some other measure to get out of this spa plan for Ontario Place? Absolutely. A hundred percent. I mean, look, uh, and by the way, look, this is a government that hasn't had trouble tearing up uh, contracts. <laughs> they've, cu- they've, they've done that at enormous expense to Ontario. $225 million My, for brewers. Yeah, it, exactly. And so, um, you know, also they could get, you know, beer in corner stores a year early, right? Come on. Um, so I would... Absolutely. And we have been looking at that lease. You know, we pushed for almost two years to to have that lease released. Uh, it's just come out. Uh, it's it's very, it's a great deal for Therma. <laughs> it is a great deal for Therma. It is a terrible deal for the people of Ontario. And so we are absolutely going to look at any uh, opportunities we have to, uh, to get out of that lease. I think there would probably be money involved. But I think at the end of the day, if you look at what it's going to cost Ontarians, it's a terrible deal. So uh, something has to change. Back to politics here. This uh, last question for me. And um, I guess I want to I, I set this up by saying you and I, a few weeks back, we did a QA and a at the Empire yeah. Club of Canada. And I asked you this question on that occasion. So the people in that room know your answer, but the people who watch and listen to this podcast mm-hmm. do not. So I, I want to do this again. We've had 43 elections in the province of Ontario, Mm -hmm. and Liberals and Conservatives have won 41 of 43. For whatever reason, there are a lot of people out there, maybe some watching this, who when they think, I want to replace this government, do not think with the New Democratic Party of Ontario. Mm -hmm. What can you say to them? And of course, in the election campaign, you'll be more specific, I'm sure. But as a general statement, what would you say to them right now to get them to even consider you guys as an option? Well, I would say, I mean, first of all, why not? <laughs> why not the NDP, right? We we have been putting forward proposals. We are not just an effective opposition, we are an effective opposition. But I think also um, we have excellent ideas and we have shown that we are willing, we have, we, we I think we have great integrity and we have been very accountable to the people. Uh, I would say to the people of Ontario, and it's funny because Doug Ford kind of started to say this this week as well, but, you know, look at the last six years uh, under Doug Ford and the Conservatives. Is your life any better today? I can guarantee you there's only a few people who will say, yes, my life is better. And most of them have a deal going (laughs) with the government. Uh, You know, most people, life is not better today. People are having a difficult time. They're struggling to afford rent. Uh, People feel stuck. Uh, stuck in so many respects. They're unable to plan for the future. And so I would say to people, you know, you're going to be looking at, at the next election. My life isn't any better. Why would I reelect this government? But then I want you to go a step further back and think, how did we get here? And I look at education, health care, housing, consecutive Liberal and conservative governments over the last 30 odd years have made decision after decision that got us to this place that we are in, right, this moment we are in right now. And we have a different vision for the province. I think we are a, a party that wants to create opportunity, uh, that knows how to get things done. Um, and I think they should give us a try. And I'll, I'll tell you something else. I mean, I do think like they need to get to know me, certainly. And that is a challenge I have because I'm a new, I'm a new leader. Um, <clears throat> but um, as they get to know me, I think they'll learn that I actually have a lot to contribute, that our caucus is, has enormous experience. We represent ridings in every corner of this province, which not, nobody else can really say. And, uh, and I think that we have the team that can really try, you know, can start to bring Ontario back to being the economic powerhouse uh, that it once was. Uh, One of my questions that I I keep sort of bubbling around, you mentioned, you know, having representatives in every corner of the province, you know, you are a Toronto MPP, Mm -hmm. Doug Ford is a Toronto MPP, Mm -hmm. Uh, Bonnie Crombie, not yet an MPP, but will seek a seat in Mississauga, you know, uh, Mike Schreiner is admittedly a Guelph MPP, but you know, really constrained politics around the GTA. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering, 
um, and I think about this with, you know, the Premier of Ontario currently fixated about bike lanes in Toronto. Mm. What does when, he call it? The great state of Etobicoke, yeah, I think is he what he it. said. He does. Yeah. Um, and when you, uh, when you travel around mm-hmm. the province, mm-hmm. I mean, what do you hear from people about yeah. the centrality of yeah. Toronto in provincial oh, yeah, politics? Absolutely. Well, you know what? I do. And it, it's interesting because I was actually um, uh, talking to my partner about this the other day. We... I think I come at this from a pretty unique perspective, actually, because I grew up outside of, not just outside of Toronto, <laughs> but outside of Ontario. Not even on the front uh, one I mean, you know, <laughs> you, <laughs> no, we're on the You're not even line. on the mainland. No, lady. I wasn't even on the mainland. <laughs> and, uh, and so I think I have a, I, I, I understand that, fe- I always have, that, that, feel, that, that sense that people have that it's always Toronto. Toronto always gets everything. And, uh, and that you can't understand what my life is like if you haven't, you know, if you live in Toronto and you're from that background. Um, I, and I'm very proud of my community. I love living where I live. I, I raised my children in Davenport. But, you know, I, I know what it's like to feel isolated, um, to uh, live in a rural community. I know what it's like to see those, uh, all those politicians pay all that attention uh, and all those jobs and opportunities go to that city. And, um, and I think that Ontarians do need to hear a different perspective. I, I mean, you know, I, I, like I said, I have a huge amount of time. I love my, the city I live in, and I, I feel very proud of it. But I, I think that we have to have a plan that doesn't leave all of those other communities out. And I say that, and I think especially of northern Ontario right now, because things are just really bad. And, you know, I was at the Meet the Miners event last night and talking to mining company uh, representatives. And the, when I asked one of the companies out of Kirkland Lake, I said, what is the one thing that you think the provincial government should be doing right now to support your sector? And you know, the first thing they said to me was, we need doctors in hmm. Northern Ontario. We need, and then the second thing was, we need childcare. We have women who want to work in our mines and in these jobs, and we can't keep them because we don't have childcare. We can't keep families here because we don't have doctors. Like, so again, it's it's that, like I said this at the beginning, I think of this um, conversation, it's the social infrastructure that they've forgotten. And we are not going to be able to do all of the great things that we want to do as a province, um, to take advantage of the opportunities that we have and create jobs and build back that future if we're not thinking about that, because we are going to rely on those resources. So what does that look like? You know, does the government even have a plan? And I can tell you what, they do not. So um, that worries me. Uh, I think it's a very short-sighted view, and I don't think we're going to be able to take advantage of this moment if we don't, if we don't act quickly. On that note, that's our time. Marit Stiles, we're grateful you came into TVO tonight and had this conversation with us, and we look forward to doing it again. Thank you. Next time, I though, I'm definitely going to wear one of my T-shirts. Okay, Good. You're on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank lot. you so much for having Thank me. You. Time now for our regular feature, Your Column, My Column, in which JMM and I reminisce about the columns we wrote for our website, tvo.org, over the past week. Start us off, my friend. What do you got? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, this week, I'm going to talk about Bill 201. Which, oh, I know uh, it well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a liberal uh, private member bill from Karen McCrimmon uh, that uh, would have made it easier to turn uh, vacant offices into homes. And yes, I used the past tense there, and we'll get to that in a second. Uh, the text of the bill here is, uh, you know, I, I've seen a lot of private members bills in my day. This was interesting to me because it is laser focused, not just on like a specific issue, not just on a specific law, on a specific like subclause of a single regulation uh, relevant to Ontario env- environmental law. Basically, uh, it, very briefly, there is a rule that says you can't change the use of a building if it is higher than six stories. And there are lots of reasons why the government wants to keep people from just changing the use of a building. You don't want somebody turning a toxic waste sump- a site into uh, a daycare without somebody knowing about it, but right? does this also prevent an office from being converted to housing? This is exactly the issue that, um, and, and uh, apparently, uh, so uh, Ms. McCrimmon is uh, the Canada 
um, Carlton. Canada Carlton uh, MPP. Uh, this has been something that Ottawa City staff have uh, been, uh, as I understand it, have been raising with anybody who will listen to them. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the rule prevents uh, any office building that is greater than six stories uh, from being converted to a residential use unless they file this really lengthy, time consuming and expensive report with the Ministry of the Environment. And so McCrimmon's bill would have uh, eliminated this specific requirement, the, the specifically the height-based requirement. So you could theoretically do housing more easily. Yeah. And, you know, there would still be other rules. There would be zoning and planning rules and all that stuff. But this little individual hurdle would be gone. Uh, this is at the same time as there are lots of interesting uh, uh, firms globally, and, and I wrote about one in this column, uh, that are finding new and interesting ways to uh, use this. Uh, use the, these spaces, but uh, alas, it is all for naught because uh, we published this on Tuesday and uh, womp womp on Wednesday morning, uh, the government majority uh, voted against the bill. Uh, this is still aimed at a, a really tiny regulation, so the government could still act on their own accord. Uh, they don't actually need to pass uh, a bill to fix this, um, but uh, I suspect if they do move ahead with this, uh, they will not be giving uh, Ms. McCrimmon the credit for it. So that's the question. It, it, did they vote it down because they're really opposed to this change, or did they vote it down because it came from the liberals and they don't want to give them credit? I mean, you could see uh, at the press conference that um, uh, Ms. McCrimmon and uh, various other liberal MPPs uh, had, uh, you know, they said this should have been a no-brainer for the government. This is red tape that nobody in government could explain why this rule is there. Uh, it... it uh, it should have been an easy one to say yes to. We've seen this game before, and with, with <laughs> governments of different parties too, uh, where you know they they say no to a private member's bill only to later reannounce the policy. Um, and maybe they will give credit to uh, a member from the opposition. Uh, maybe they will not. Uh, I'm I'm betting they will not. But uh, uh, yeah, th that. That, as we say, it's a story we've seen before. This is a perfect column for you because it's deep in the weeds of planning and housing and all the things <laughs> that you love about this world. Yeah, and, and like, <laughs> I, I do love to... Uh, uh, I love to get into the meat of, of like the machinery of how government works, mm. right? And so here you have this tiny little regulation that I did not know about until earlier this week. No clue. I got to learn something, and I got to, I hope, uh, teach uh, at least a handful of readers about as well. Well, I think this is one of the reasons why you and I get along so well, is that you that 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 is the stuff where you live and love. Yes. Whereas I, I really love the stories about the people who are in politics m much yes. more than, you know, subsection 2, <laughs> sub subsection C of the planning code or whatever. And, and so I wrote a column this past week about a guy, and I have nothing to base this on other than I'm sure it's true. There is no politician in the history of the province of Ontario currently in the legislature or elected at some point over the last 157 years who knows more about the history of the province of Ontario than Sean Conway. And for those of you who are of a certain age, you will remember Sean Conway. Let's bring the picture up of him, Sheldon, if we can here. There he is, uh, him on the right, David Peterson, the man he served, former Premier of Ontario on the left. Sean Conway was the MPP for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke in Eastern Ontario for 28 years. He first got elected as a 24-year-old Queen's University student, so he went way back. His most important years in the legislature were in the mid-1980s when he was the education minister for David Peterson, and it was his job to stick handle full funding for separate schools through the legislative process, and that was really quite a Herculean task. It was... I mean, it was one of the most complicated changes in education policy we've ever had in the province of Ontario, and it was his job to make it happen. I wrote about him this week because he was given by an organization called the Ontario Association of Former Parliamentarians the Distinguished Service Award last week. And so they had a very nostalgic get-together, a lunch at Queen's Park, and a bunch of people spoke, and he spoke, and um, yeah, it was a lovely event. There aren't, there have not been, Many MPPs in the history of the province where if you were in your office at Queen's Park and you had the TV on and you heard a speech coming from the legislature, that you drop what you were doing and say, oh, I not only want to listen to this, I think I actually want to dash into the house and watch this guy speak. Sean Conway was one of those guys. A great speaker, an effective legislator, so much so that when his political career was over, 
uh, we wanted to create, we, had, we were doing a show back then on TVO called Fourth Reading, which was sort of a weekly Queens Park show. Not unlike this, although we had a guest panel every week, and we decided to put together three former education ministers. Janet Ecker, who was a former Tory education minister, Dave Cook from Windsor, who's a former New Democrat, and Sean Conway. And <laughs> there were, I can't tell you how many shows we did where Ecker, Cook, and I would look at each other while Sean was talking, and the unspoken <laughs> telepathy between the three of us was, how the hell does he know this? How does he know all this? How does he know all this? Anyway, the capper on the story is Sean Conway is now 73 years old. He is fighting stage four metastatic cancer. He has been for a few years. Remarkably, he looks great. He's doing immunotherapy, and it seems to be Fingers working crossed, yeah. for now. And um, he looks far younger than his 73 years would lead you, lead you to believe. And uh, in, in my view, a very well-deserved recipient for this honor. I just I do want to say about Conway that uh, I, I came to Queen's Park uh, after uh, he left elected office. I got to Queen's Park in 2013. And uh, he, his, his reputation is such that there were any number of times where uh, I, you know, I would be reporting something and somebody would say to me, you know, when you've got the time, you should really talk to Sean Conway about this. Mm. And I, I think that's maybe one of the finest reputations you could possibly have as a, as a legislator to be, in my case, yeah, he was 10 years gone from the legislature mm. and people were still saying, yeah, you know, who knows the stuff backwards and forwards? It's Sean. It is so, him. Yeah. He has one significant fault. <laughs> Brevity is not his thing. <laughs> he was supposed to give a 15 minute speech and went on for 45 minutes. But you know what? It was, I got to say, it was interesting. I mean, the guy just went through a whole cavalcade of Ontario political history. And those of us who are kind of nerds for that stuff really quite enjoyed it. There are uh, MPPs who I say uh, they were uh, born for an era of digital recorders and <laughs> don't have to lug around 20 pounds of tape. Uh, with that, uh, let us go to the mailbag. Indeed. If you've got a burning question or insightful comment, please send it to us at on politics at tvo.org. JMM, what's up this week? Uh, this is an email from Ignacio Ropolo. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Ignacio, uh, who says, uh, I really enjoyed your interview with Mike Schreiner. Steve and John Michael asked him some great questions, except I wish you would have asked Mike to talk about amalgamating the public and Catholic school systems in light of the $145,000 trip by the Brant Haldman Norfolk Catholic District School Board trustees. The Green Party is the only party that has that in their platform, but it seems even the Green Party has been rather silent on the issue lately. A study a few years ago estimated the cost savings would be around $1.6 billion. Perhaps you can do a segment on this issue. Cheers. Ignacio, thank you for that letter. First, a little background for those who haven't followed this story. Uh, this school board in question wanted to purchase some statues and sculptures for their schools, but they wanted to see what they were purchasing for their money. So they spent $45,000 traveling to Italy to see that which they were considering purchasing. And uh, the Minister of Education, Jill Dunlop, did not think that was a particularly wise expenditure of public funds. She launched an investigation. Meanwhile, the trustees have paid back the money to try to get out from underneath this uh, issue. Controversy. Let's just call that. <laughs> yeah, controversy. Okay. To Ignacio's bigger question, should this prompt a revisiting of the unifying school governance into one single public school system policy, rather than having, as we do right now, a public school governance system, a Catholic school governance system, a French school governance system. Um, okay, Ignacio, I hate to disappoint you, but here's the truth. While the Green Party did once campaign on merging the school boards together, and incidentally in the election, and it was a few ago, that they did this, they doubled their vote. They didn't get any more seats, but they did double their vote. This is actually not technically part of the Green Party platform anymore. It was not in the last election. It was not. No, I remember asking Mike Schreiner about this, and he said, no, it's not part of our thing anymore. We're, we're trying to lower the heat on, uh, on education reform. So technically, none of the four parties represented in the legislature with seats at Queen's Park today have unifying school governance as part of their platforms. That's just the reality. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the idea of saving a billion dollars is, uh, is always appealing. The billion dollars is... A lot of money uh, for mere mortals like you and I. Um, it's also not a ton of money in the scope of Ontario's uh, education system, right? That's the, you know many tens of billions of dollars are spent every year. Um, and I know that uh, former Premier Kathleen Wynne, when asked about this, would say, you know, and frankly, you know, you still have to educate all of the kids, right? And so the savings are probably exaggerated. Savings are almost always exaggerated in these matters, aren't <laughs> yes. they? 
Um, on the uh, issue of school trustees, we do also want to let our uh, viewers and listeners know that TVO has just dropped a trailer for a new series that we've been working on called uh, Queries. Uh, it looks at queer and trans inclusion in the Catholic school system, starting with some uh, incendiary remarks made by a Catholic school trustee in the uh, Toronto Catholic School Board. Uh, we will link to that trailer in the show notes, and if you'd like to check that out, please do. Which uh, I would say parenthetically is another reason why some people think the Catholic school system ought to be ended, defunded, put it however you like. Yes. Uh, except we have to remember it was part of the deal at Confederation that Protestants in Quebec get a fully funded school system yes. and Catholics in Ontario get a fully funded school system. And the Catholic system actually was not fully funded until Sean Conway did it yes. in 1986. So there's your history coming yeah. full cycle there. And also in 2024, Quebec has for many decades, got rid of it. Well, that is true, isn't it? <laughs> yes, Quebec and Newfoundland actually ditched their Protestant uh, school systems. and uh, But here we are still supporting the Catholic system in Ontario all yes. these years later. Uh, yes, that that uh, uh, undoing that will be a topic for a longer podcast sometime. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> uh, if you'd like to ask about the content of the show, do please remember you can always email us at onpolitics at tvo.org. And that is the On Poly podcast for this Friday, October 25th, 2024. You can follow our show on Apple Podcasts so you get notified each time a new episode is available. And you can see the video version of the podcast on the TVO Today YouTube channel. Any feedback you have, we're happy to hear it. Good, bad, or indifferent. Write us at onpolitics at tvo.org. Please ensure that you include your first and last name and where you're located. This week's episode was produced and edited by Matthew O'Mara, video editing by Colin Kish. Production support from Jonathan Hallowell and TVO's digital media services team. Our managing editor is Katie O'Connor. Lori Few is the executive producer of digital. John Ferry is vice president of programming and content. Special thanks, as always, to our wonderful studio crew for making the video podcast happen. And my shout out this week goes to a guy who's sitting in the back room, deep in the bowels of the control room. That's Larry Curry. Larry Curry is one of the few people here who has been here longer than me. I remember my first day here in 1992 and he was already here. Larry's one of the guys who makes sure that the sound is good, that the pictures are good. Mr. Technology in the back room there. So Larry, my salute is to you. Thanks buddy. Until next Friday. Oh, I call him Sparky. That's his nickname. Okay. Cause he's always the spark of the party here. Well, not always, but sometimes. Thanks Sparky. Until next Friday, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye.